Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. So on behalf of the Environmental Finance Center Network, welcome to the third session in our Operator Certification Webinar Series on an overview of wastewater treatment. My name is Avery Davis from the Syracuse University Environmental Finance Center. And before we begin, we're gonna cover a few logistics and then we'll get started. During the webinar today, everyone will be kept on mute to ensure audio quality. If you have a question, please type it into the GoToWebinar question dialog box anytime throughout the session. We'll be saving your questions for a facilitated Q&A session at the end of the presentation. After the webinar, you will receive a follow-up email that includes a link to the recording and other information you may need. You can also download the slides from today in the Handouts tab in your GoToWebinar control panel. This webinar has not been submitted for pre-approval of continuing education credits, but eligible attendees will receive a certificate of attendance for their personal record. To receive a certificate for this session, you must attend for the entire webinar and register and attend individually using your real name and unique email address. Certificates will be sent via email within 30 days of the webinar date. And if you have any questions or need assistance, please contact us at smallsystems at syr.edu. Now for a little bit about the Environmental Finance Center Network. We provide training and technical assistance to small water and wastewater systems in all U.S. states and territories through our building technical, managerial, and financial capacity programs. If your community or utility needs assistance with drinking water or wastewater system management, please feel free to contact us through our request form shortly in the chat. And on that note, I would like to introduce our presenter for today. So we have AJ Barney, who is a research scientist at the Southwest Environmental Finance Center at the University of New Mexico. So welcome, AJ, and I'm handing everything over to you. Quick question, well, hi, AJ, before you, before you start. Um, uh, Avery, is there a closed caption option for this? Uh, we got uh, I don't, yeah, I don't believe we have a closed caption option at this time. Um, we are exploring options that are compatible with GoToWebinar, um, and we have yet to find a clear solution. So if anyone in the audience has any recommendations, um, I would love to um, to hear those. But we are exploring it, and I do apologize that we cannot offer that accommodation at this time. Okay. We had two questions on that, so I just wanted to make sure that that was, was answered out loud. Thank you, James. Okay, well, I guess I will go ahead and start my presentation now. Um, like Avery said, uh, my name is AJ, and I am a research engineer with the Southwest Environmental Finance Center based out of the University of New Mexico. A little bit about my background, I am a civil engineer and a biologist who has worked in wastewater for 10 years. I have a New Mexico wastewater level four operator certification. Um, I previously worked for the Albuquerque Water Authority as an operator and also in compliance, uh, supervising uh, compliance sampling and also running various like pre-treatment programs. I have also uh, been working with the Southwest Environmental Finance Center since last year. Uh, before we talk uh, about the general wastewater overview, I do want to touch on operator certification for a little bit. Um, so. Operator certifications are typically overseen by state environmental departments. Some examples of this are the EPA, or from the EPA Region 6, are the Texas Commission of Environmental Quality, New Mexico Environmental Department, and the Oklahoma Department of Environmental Quality. Some of you guys are probably familiar with this. I'm assuming a lot of you guys um, have taken your certification levels, or for anyone new, this is uh, some good information. There is also EPA operator certification which is designed to have reciprocity with state levels and is utilized by communities such as tribes and smaller communities that aren't overseen by states. So each of these agencies have their own level hierarchy based on the different type of criteria that the certification may serve. And this could include the complexity of the system, the population of the system, and uh, the years of experience required to operate the plant. There are uh, various resources each of the state offers such as need to know criteria for their exams. It's usually a list of topics that are gonna to be on the exams with a little more detail. 
Uh, some states offer study guides. And then there's also the California State University Sacramento Wastewater Operations Manual and Course, which is usually the go-to for a lot of municipalities. Um, it is important to become familiar with these resources provided by your state, especially information for what will be on the exam uh, when you're getting ready to take those uh, certification exams. And uh, this webinar series is a great overview for it, uh, but many of the topics, for many of the topics we cover, but the best strategy we want to uh, pass on for passing the exam is to learn what is on your exam and studying those topics. Uh, it's very hard to cover these in the detail that is required in the hour that we have. Uh, but I rec recommend noting the processes that we talk about and diving into the details, especially such as like operation parameters and design parameters on your own. Um, you know, things like flow rates, detention times, inspection of concentrations, because each process area will have their own. Uh, it's, you know, most people need a lot of time to dedicate to these, such as hours, months, you know, it's uh, a long process. Um, but I just want to point that out before we go into uh, more detail. So we're going to start with why do we treat wastewater? So it's important to remove pollution and contaminants that are known to cause damage to the receiving bodies of water and disrupt the ability of other communities to treat drinking water. Uh, improperly treated wastewater can cause human sickness in waters that are used for fishing, recreation, and as drinking water sources. Usually the water that you treat at a wastewater facility is going downstream to someone else. So improperly treated wastewater that is discharged to the environment can immediately kill local wildlife and cause long-term issues and permanently affect the landscape. And then also, um, you know, a main reason that most people treat it is that's federally, federally regulated. Uh, you don't have a choice. The government uh, has a lot of NPDES permits and any wastewater treatment that discharges to a point source such as a river or lake is required to have what's known as an NPDES permit. Uh, for anyone unfamiliar with that, that's permit set by the EPA. Uh, it stands for National Pollution Discharge Elimination System. And they set loading limits on the different type of contaminants in wastewater that a wastewater treatment plant has to treat for. So that's the why we treat wastewater. Now for the what we treat wastewater, um, we treat wastewater for excessive nutrients, such as BOD, that's biological oxygen demand, that is considered the wastewater strength of um, the contaminants, and then also nitrogen phosphorus. Those excessive nutrients can lead to eutrophication. Um, eutrophication is where you know, algae thrives on these high nutrient environments, and they outcompete other plants and wildlife in the affected area. They will grow out of control and as they consume a lot of oxygen, and as they start to die, um, the, they also consume, the microorganisms that decompose them consume oxygen, which depletes uh, the environment and makes it uninhabitable for other wildlife. Uh, this creates dead zones or septic conditions, and it turns the water area basically into a swamp. Um, we also wanna treat for pathogens. Uh, that's pathogens are microorganisms that cause human diseases. Uh, some important ones to know that are frequently appear in certification exams are cholera, typhoid, hepatitis, dysentery, and polio. Then you also want to treat for solids and debris. Um, this solids and debris add to our already current amounts of litter. I'm sure a lot of you have seen our bodies of water that just are full of trash. Um, so it's important to treat that so you know wastewater isn't also a source of that. Uh, this is especially important for such things as plastics, which slowly break down in the environment and increases the ongoing concern for the effects of microplastics on the environment. We treat for other things like pH, heavy metals, and emerging contaminants. Uh, these can affect the environment in a variety of ways. Human metals can disrupt the development in wildlife and humans. And it's also the same with um, emerging contaminants like pharmaceuticals that can act as endocrine disruptors and um, wildlife isn't allowed to um, breed correctly or develop. Um, and there's also lots of other stuff that is being put in the environment that we're not even sure what they do yet. So here are some general treatment processes and what they're, so Preliminary treatment, um, this is designed to treat for some of the debris that we talked about. This removes trash out of the environment. Um, then primary treatment is designed to remove organic matter. Um, 
The biological treatment is used to reduce nutrient loading. And then secondary treatment is typically used to further remove the organics um, that are already in the wastewater and those that are created during biological treatment. Uh, then is followed as tertiary treatment. And that's typically a polishing stage and typically consists, and then is also includes disinfection, which we listed below, but sometimes is categorized differently. Um, and that may also incorporate specialized contamination removal, such as the precipitation of mercury or phosphorus or some sort of filtering. And then finally, we have sludge handling, which is the process that removes solids created by all the other processes. And that is the ability, that creates the ability to dispose of them in a safe and healthy way. So this is a typical um, wastewater treatment train, um, as you'll see in big plants. Um, I'm not sure if you know a lot of you guys are from large wastewater treatment plants or small package plants, but this would be more of um, like a large scale uh, treatment plant. So this kind of shows the order that the things come in. And it's the same as the list that in the previous slide. So wastewater will come in as influent. That's what you call water entering the wastewater treatment plant, wastewater. Um, and then you typically have fine screens and grit removal. And after you get that stuff out of the way, it's followed by primary clarification. And as you can see from primary clarification, there's also the offshoot of um, going to the solids treatment train. And so that's uh, you have to pump sludge to the um, solid handling. And then finally, you'd have uh, your biological treatment. In this example, there's an aeration basin, and that aeration basin uh, will then um, lead to more second uh, clarification, which is a secondary clarifier. And you can see that there is also waste sludge from that that needs to be handled. Um, after secondary clarification, uh, your water typically looks like what you're going to see in the river, except there's going to be things that you can't see in it. Um, and that's where you would use disinfection. In this example, there's chlorination. So what we need to follow would be dechlorination. And at that point, you can uh, discharge your treated wastewater to the river. Or in this example, it's a river, but it can also be a, a lake, a stream, anything like that that's a point source. So I wanna talk about a couple important wastewater concepts. Um, the first is BOD. And like I talked about earlier, this is the wastewater, it's considered the strength of the wastewater. Uh, this is important because it describes how much oxygen would be consumed by the raw wastewater. And typically the test is a five day test that shows how much oxygen is consumed over those five days at a steady temperature of 20 degrees. Next is the carbon cycle. Uh, this is your aerobic and anaerobic respiration processes. It's important to understand how organics are consumed in the wastewater process and the different pathways that they follow. Um, and this also will affect the different type of processes that each plant has, such as, you know, someone might have anaerobic processes. Most have aerobic, which incorporates a little bit of oxygen. Uh, there's also uh, the nitrogen cycle, which is manipulated to remove ammonia and nitrate. And this helps you understand uh, how each of these are removed at different points in the process. Then there is the sulfur cycle. Uh, the sulfur cycle results in usually harmful materials that we want to keep an eye on, such as sulfuric acid and hydrogen sulfide gas. Um, and it's important to understand how these uh, form because they can cause harm to wastewater workers and also deteriorate the collection system and equipment at the wastewater plant. Uh, next is specific gravity. This is the density that a substance has compared to water. and this. This concept is usually manipulated to create physical separation and separate solids from wastewater. Um, and it's a big part of, you know, clarification, um, grit removal. So, of, you know, three of our you know, seven main processes or so. So here's the nitrogen cycle. Uh, this is how the nitrogen cycle occurs out in the environment. And so, it, the nitrogen cycle is important because you want to know the different forms that are present throughout the plant and how it transforms during those different processes and what conditions those processes create or what, pro what conditions those processes have to occur in, um, such as anaerobic or aerobic um, timeframes. Um, it is also important to understand the different forms of nitrogen that can be available in wastewater uh, because how they're regulated in your MPDES permit. Examples of this are total inorganic nitrogen, which is your nitrite, nitrate, and ammonia, or your TKN, or total kiljol nitrogen, which is 
composed of the organically bound nitrogen and ammonia. So basic nitrogen exists in the atmosphere and it's typically fixed to plants um, you, uh, by microorganisms. Uh, then you know those plants are harvested as food and they're consumed by humans and we secrete them as urea um, in our urine and that is decomposed to ammonia and ammonia arrives at the wastewater plant where we treat it and you can see through here an example of that is you know the ammonium uh, that's typically how it, it the ammonia exists in wastewater at the ph that it's at so it goes from ammonia, at the bottom of the screen you can see it goes from ammonium and you have nitrification which creates nitrites and then nitrates and then you would have denitrification which results in atmospheric nitrogen which is the goal of a lot of plants that do nitrification and denitrification. So here's the sulfur cycle. So sulfur exists naturally in the collection system. And so the collection system is typically anaerobic or oxygen free. And those conditions cause sulfate reducing microbes to convert sulfates that are at the bottom of the collection system to turn into hydrogen sulfide gas. Hydrogen sulfide gas is poison to humans it's known to smell like rotten eggs at very low levels. And the issue with that is that at slightly elevated levels, you don't smell it anymore and it causes nose blindness. So a lot of people think that it might be gone and this causes problems at wastewater plants. Um, but instead of being gone, it's elevating. And then at even higher levels, it can be deadly. You'll typically run into this at in your collection system and then also in your pretreatment systems. Um, there are odor control systems typically in place in collection systems that utilizes things like ferric uh, chloride that help reduce hydrogen sulfide issues. Um, it's also important to have gas detectors in receiving facilities to detect excessive levels and warn operators or plant personnel to not enter those areas if there's high hydrogen sulfide levels. Uh, proper ventilation can help in these situations um, uh, for the hydrogen sulfide gas. Then the other issue with uh, sulfur is that hydrogen sulfide in the collection system um, will flow to the top of the system where sulfur oxidizing micro microbes exist and they oxidize the hydrogen sulfide to form sulfuric acid. The sulfuric acid creates something called crown rot which deteriorates the collection system and damages equipment in the wastewater treatment plant. <clears throat> So after uh, the collection system, the first step you probably usually have is pretreatment. Uh, this is um, designed to remove larger solids and rags. Um, there's also grit removal. Uh, this is where flow measurement might uh, exist, and then also flow equalization. So solids and rags that you see that we see are rags, wrappers, flushable wipes that aren't really flushable. Um, I think a lot of wastewater workers are pretty familiar with that and then all kinds of plastic and rubber products. Uh, grit must be removed to prevent uh, downstream equipment deterioration, uh, especially when it comes to pumps and other devices which have soft components integrated into their hard metal or concrete components. Uh, flow measurement is important to understand because it will show you what's coming into the plant in terms of flow and also um, possibly loading. And then sampling may also occur here to understand the wastewater profile of the influent. Um, and that is also important for adjusting operations throughout the day. Uh, smaller plants typically don't have that, but like big plants will have online meters and stuff like that, or just you know daily sampling in the morning and daily sampling in the afternoon to see what's coming in, what's coming out. Um, and then flow equalization is important to account for fluctuations throughout the day. You might see this in smaller plants uh, where the stuff, you know, the, during low flow, it's not nearly as high as high flow, and they have those daily fluctuations, and you kind of equally distribute that through the day with a flow equalization tank. Flow equalization might also be um, use dissolved air to freshen up um, and have the um, septic stuff that's coming in oxygenized. So here's just a quick chart of some of the typical pollutants that you might see in wastewater system. Um, including the influent concentrations and the goal of the plant to remove those. Um, and this chart can be a little hard to follow. Um, at the top, you're going to see where it says influent and concentration, influent goals. So that's comparing what you want to, what you typically see coming in and what you want to see leaving the plant. And then on the bottom, you'll see our 30-day average and seven-day average. Um, this is typical for a lot of MPDS permits, 
So it's an important rule to remember, and it's the 30-45 rule. So typically, uh, the 30-day average that's required for BOD and TSS is 30 milligrams per liter. <clears throat> and the seven-day average would be uh, 45 and 45 milligrams per liter. And these are effluent concentration. So these are typically the goals that you want to see the plant treat to. So the first uh, thing we'll talk about in pretreatment is our bar screens. So this is typically the first process that wastewater influent encounters when it enters the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, bar screens are comprised of multiple parallel slanted or vertical bars that are placed close together so that wastewater can flow through the bar screen while debris and coarse debris are trapped in the bars. These can be manually or mechanically operated and are usually oriented so that the screenings enter a conveyance device such as a trench, a bin, or a conveyor belt that convince, uh, conveys the screens to um, the disposal bin. Manual bar screens are usually present at smaller wastewater facilities, and automatic bar screens are usually required at larger facilities where mechanical devices are more efficient than manpower. It's really hard to have someone scraping uh, bar screens all day. You know, if you're at a large plant, I'm sure you'd rather be doing something else. Um, and these can be either triggered uh, by a mechanism or by um, manually for the bar screens. And then the bar screens should also be constructed from stainless steel to resist the corrosion caused by the gases that we talked about, such as H2S. Uh, there are also two different categories of bar screens. Um, when the steel bars are placed three eighths to two inches apart, they're known as bar screens. And when the openings are actually larger than that two inch, they're considered bar racks. And bar racks are usually utilized by uh, bypass channels to provide a small amount of screening during uh, maintenance or bypass events. Uh, disposal bins and hoppers should be designed to minimize water content in the rags and to allow for trans uh, efficient transport. Uh, typically, after the screenings are screened up the uh, bar screen, they go into like a trench or something that may be um, used by gravity or water or air belt, and that's what goes to these disposal bins. Uh, so it's important to understand that these devices need to be well maintained uh, through proper lubrication and frequent observation, uh, especially for mechanical um, bar screens. You know, they got to be made sure that nothing's clogging them to prevent uh, permanent damage. So one type of uh, screening device that's um, typical in smaller plants is a communitor. And this is actually a device that it combines a grinder and a pump, and it shreds racks and debris and leaves them in the wastewater where they can be digested um, in a secondary process. Uh, so these are useful because you don't have to have a bar screen, um, but they can clog equipment and be labor intensive, and they also require electricity, which you know manual bar screens do not. So here's uh, two examples of some grit removal technology. Um, on the left is an aerated channel, and on the right is something called a head cell. So grit is important to remove. Um, or actually, I'm sorry. First of all, uh, grit is composed of sand and sediment and eggshells that can damage the impellers of plants or be deposited in downstream basins, removing their, reducing their capacity and efficiency. So the buildup can actually be so extreme that it, the flow can be stopped completely in certain areas or it can make them just um, inoperable. Uh, the amount of grit present in wastewater influence is going to depend on the plant, the area that it's in, and also the collection system. But typically about one to four cubic feet of grit should be removed for every million gallon of wastewater treated. Uh, grit is also separated from liquid by, uh, like we talked about, uh, specific gravity. So they utilize that um, concept to manipulate it and to pull out the grit. Um, so on the left is one of the, is, isn't quite this method we're going to talk about, but um, a simple method is the long channel, which is approximately a 20 to 40 feet and slows down the flow to one foot per second. That allows the grit to settle and water to pass through the system. Um, also baffles can be used to account for daily fluctuations in flow. Now an adjustment to this would be the aeration, um, the aerated grit channel. Such as, and that's what's pictured on the left. And that uses dissolved air to make the wastewater even less dense and cause the grit to settle more efficiently. 
Uh, this, does, this will decrease the spatial footprint of the grit removal process. It does not require the flow to be slowed down. Uh, this can all either be done in a straight channel or in a serpentine to reduce uh, land use. Uh, for most systems, when too much grit is accumulated, they must be bypassed and cleaned out. Or pumps can also be insert, uh, installed at the bottom, which continuously pump out the grit daily. Uh, then on the right, we have what's called, like I told you, a, whole, a head cell. And this removes grit through centrifugal technology. So the water will spin and move to the outside, while heavier solids will move to the middle and pass down. And then you also use a grit classifier in this, where it's pumped up to the grit classifier that also uses centrifugal technology. And the water spins, the solids settle to the bottom, and then they're conveyed out. And this riches off the organics on the solids, so those can go get treated in the wastewater plant. And a lot of times, just plain organics are wanted in the wastewater um, plant um, to make sure that those bugs are happy. So here's a couple of examples of uh, flow measurement devices. These are both manual devices. On the left, we have a partial flume, and on the right, we have a staff gauge. Uh, these are typically used in open channels, and they are an example of a manual device. Uh, there are also automatic devices um, for inline pumps, such as Venturi meters and magnetic flow meters, which will display the flow going through instantaneously. Um, all of these devices uh, show uh, the flow that is instantaneous at that moment. Oh, I'm sorry. I was on the wrong slide. Um, okay, sorry. So those are just examples of um, devices that are flow that show flow instantaneously. And there's also such things as bubblers and other probes that are utilized to totalize flow readings and measure the daily flow. Here is the slide that I was referring to. So sorry about that. Um, on the left, like I said, it's a partial flume. On the right is the staff gauge. So uh, some important stuff for like certification is understanding where the reading for a partial flume might be, which is typically two thirds of the way up the approach channel. And then also on the right, um, this flow meter is, or this flow, the staff gauge is usually installed four times the maximum head rise to prevent false readings. So those are just some examples of things you might run into in a certification test for flow measurement. And like I said, these are installed in open channels. So after pretreatment, after measurement, you're going to have primary treatment. So primary treatment is a physical process, and it's designed to remove about 90 to 90% of your settable solids, uh, 40 to 60% of your suspended solids, and 30 to 40% of your BOD. And this also this is where we first have our sludge removal process that will go to solids handling. And the purpose of this is to remove material that will settle to the bottom or float to the top of the wastewater when the flow is slowed down. Uh, this process also relies on specific gravity and allows the water that resides in the middle layers of this um, basin to pass on to the next treatment process. So here we have a diagram of a typical clarifier. So they are typically consist of a tank, a scraper, a drive unit, an influent baffle, um, a weir and a scum tray slash trough. So you can see that there's the big basin that's holding all the equipment um, on this uh, clarifier. Um, in the, here in the middle is where the water will come out um, at the top of the um, basin. And then you have the baffle wall, which actually slows down the water. It kind of absorbs the kinetic energy of the water. So it slows it down and evenly distributes it throughout the clarifier which allows the solids to settle evenly and to prevent NE um, short circuiting. Uh, up here on the top, you'll have a scraper arm that scrapes the floating solids. This is typically fats, oil, and grease, or stuff that's just lighter than water. water. And you have a trough over here on the left where that is collected. On the bottom is the scraper mechanism, which pushes all the sludge to the bottom where it can be pumped out. And then it's a little hard to see, but on the edge of the basin on the top right, there is this little line right here. That's the weir. So that prevents the solids that float from passing through the water, but the water just under it to pass over and into the next process. Um, this is all ran by a drive motor in the middle. And you can see that just a little, I don't know, the non-cartoon um, drive up here. So operators should understand how the pumping occurs. 
um, how to alter pump piping to pump scum trays if that's necessary or if that's how the systems pump, and also to how to measure the performance of the system. Uh, this typically involves using a core measuring device to measure the depth of the sludge blanket um, with a core sampler or that's also known as a sludge judge. Uh, for certification process purposes, it's important to understand that the sludge blanket depth is usually two to three feet, but this will vary from plant to plant. And they're also designed where the detention time for clarifiers is two to three hours. Um, anything longer than that, you're going to get septic conditions and floating solids, anything lower, and you'll start to get passed through. Um, those high detention times will result in sludge becoming septic due to the lack of oxygen. Uh, this will interfere with your sludge handling since the sludge will float, and it will also increase the difficulty of biological treatment because there may be too many anaerobic microbes present. So here's an overview of secondary treatment. Our secondary treatment is typically designed to remove your biological oxygen demand, uh, your ammonia and your nitrate. And these come in many different shapes and sizes. Um, the examples we're gonna go over is activated sludge, trickling filters, and then rotating biological contactors. Uh, these, these concepts are derived from naturally occurring microorganisms found in the wastewater. Um, you know, people used to observe that, you know, there'd be contaminants in rivers and they would see the water flow over rocks and see the microbes in there. Um, and then I, someone eventually tried to mimic that. So these processes can be either fixed film or suspended growth. Uh, fixed film means that the microbes are attached to, uh, you know, some sort of media. And then suspended growth means that they are floating freely in the flow. Um, sometimes these require secondary clarification to deal with any microbes that are passing after the biological treatment. So the first example that we have is a trickling filter. So these are similarly constructed to a clarifier, except they're filled with rocks or a um, manufactured media. Uh, these rocks and the media are typically covered in what's called a zuglio film. And that zuglio film is what I was talking about that you might see in a river that if we are trying to mimic to treat wastewater. Uh, for trickling filters, the typical plant efficiency is about 90% removal of BOD and suspended solids. Um, so this might be used when somewhere where the um, permit isn't so strict or you're not contributing to waters that are going to someone else downstream. So the media is constructed specifically designed media. It's usually plastic, um, it might be sheets or uh, shapes that are designed to maximize the pass through, um, or it can be made of rocks that are two to four inches in diameter. Uh, so that zuglio film grows on there and mimics the natural environment like we talked about, um, and water will flow down and comes in contact with those microorganisms where they will consume the, um, bio the, you know, the organics in the wastewater, and they'll use oxygen around them to do that. Um, so the dish, the, this has a, let's see, the device that you're gonna to wanna to be familiar with. Um, you have the, at the top, you have your distribution arm, which has sprinklers on it, which distribute the wastewater. So the wastewater is coming through the top and going down to the bottom. And then you have your filter media. Um, there's also the feed pipe, which is going to uh, come from the outside and you know typically after like your primary clarification. Um, and it distributes the water up to the distribution arm. Uh, then you also have uh, some sort of filter score at the bottom, so water, can seep through the bottom and not allow the media to pass through. And then you have your collection area and your outlet. Uh, sometimes there is extra aeration involved in this to kind of more optimize the process. So the distribution arm is controlled by how much flow is put into it. So the, if you increase the um, flow, you're gonna increase the speed of your distribution arm. And if you slow it down, it's going to slow it down because it's that water that's pushing up and pushing the distribution arm to go faster or slower. So for a trickling filter for certification processes, it's important to understand the design parameters, uh, what it's gonna be used for, the operation prin uh, principles, and then also troubleshooting for the trickling filter. So this might include the types of trickling filters, whether it's a roughing filter or a primary filter, um, and what it's gonna be utilized for, uh, the recirculation rates and loading rates. So those are some concepts that you might want to be familiar with when studying for uh, the tricking filter part of the, your exam. Uh, tricking filters can also experience issues with ponding, 
odors, excessive sloughing, and filter flies. Um, typically, the way you address that is adjusting your recirculation rates. Um, and there's also, uh, this typically requires a secondary clarifier to handle the regular sloughing that will occur on these devices. So next we have a rotating biologic contactor or an RBC. And these work very similar to a trickling filter. They're also a fixed media concept. So the microorganisms live directly on the media. And these are typically cylinders made of plastic sheets that allow for media to grow and the air to be distributed. Um, they are rotated mechanically and the wastewater is allowed to collect in the contractor and trickle down through the media. Uh, the media is consisted of corrugated plastic sheets stacked over one another. And they are also, uh, as you can probably see, a cylindrical shape, which are typically 12 feet in diameter and 25 feet in length. So they typically rotate at about 1 to 1.5 rotations per minute and are submerged about 40% and the contractor is submerged. So for RBCs, it's important to understand the operation, including um, seasonal adjustments and troubleshooting. Uh, you want to understand the type of uh, orientation that might be placed in and why those are um, used in different types of plants. And then typically for RBCs, any issues that they have can be identified through observation. So if you have a darkened media, uh, usually that's due to overloading, or if their whitening is occurring, that may be a signal of toxic shock. And of course, there's always sampling and stuff like that for both of um, RBCs and trickling filters to understand if the uh, process is working correctly. So next we have activated sludge. Um, and activated sludge is usually going to be the biggest part of your certification. Um, so I don't quite have enough time to talk about as much of it as I want to, but um, a little overview is, you know, activated sludges are suspended growth secondary treatment. Um, and as most basic form is designed to remove dissolved organics and settable and non-settable solids. Uh, when you start introducing oxygen and recirculation, that's when you get nitrification and denitrification. Um, so depending on the type of plant you have, activated sludge can treat either primary wastewater or direct raw wastewater. Uh, for larger plants, you'll probably see the primary treatment and for direct, uh, for smaller plants, you might have direct raw wastewater, such as like a package plant. Um, so the reason that it's called a suspended growth media is that the combination of wastewater and microorganisms is called a mixed liquor and they will just stay suspended in the uh, process. Uh, usually this can be done either mechanically with um, mixers or with uh, oxygen and membranes that filter out that or that distribute that oxygen. So dissolved air must be used to provide complete waste stabilization and allow aerobic activity to function correctly because uh, if only anaerobes are allowed to function here it quickly kills off their ability to consume all the um, organics. Um, also recirculation can be incorporated to also include denitrification uh, after the aerobic activity um, that results in the nitrification process. So that's where that nitrification, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the nitrogen cycle comes into play. So during aerobic activity, um, in activated sludge, you usually have nitrification and you'll have denitrification in the anaerobic stage. So nitrification is ammonia getting turned into nitrates and denitrification is nitrates getting converted to uh, nitrogen gas. If you guys will remember from that diagram. Um, so for activated sludge, it's important to understand the ways to measure the time that microorganisms will spend in the process. That is usually a good indicator of how effective your process is going. Uh, there's also the food uh, to, or I'm sorry, the food to microorganism ratio. Uh, that's an important characteristic to know what type of loading will be going on in your plant. Um, also operation characters such as DO levels, flow rate, and recirculation rates uh, for activated sludge that passes to secondary clarification. Um, and for also the mixed liquor, the basins. Um, then uh, another thing is to understand the type of microorganisms that exist in the activated sludge. So you have uh, aerobic microbes, which will use oxygen, anaerobes, which will use um, so another source, like nitrate, and the faculty of anaerobes, which can use either. Um, and those are important to understand um, in the different sections of each 
uh, basin, what might be going on there. So um, in the picture here, we have two examples of activated sludge that actually do use uh, utilize recirculation. Um, the second diagram is what's known as a modified Lunzek editor process, which is the type of plant that I worked on. Uh, so influent will come into the wastewater um, and the order of what's being treated is actually opposite of the process. So you have the anoxic area and the aerobic activity. But your first thing that you're targeting is the aerobic reactor where you want to do nitrification. And then after nitrification, where and in that aerobic use, so you have the membrane providing oxygen. Um, after that aerobic activity, you recycle the mixed liquor and it goes back into the anoxic reactor where those facultative anaerobes don't have access to oxygen anymore. I'm sorry, facultative and they will um, break down biologicals and organics uh, by using those nitrates that were created in the aerobic zone. So following secondary settling, you typically um, need some, um, I'm sorry, following secondary um, treatment, you typically need secondary clarification and secondary clarification will follow the same process as primary clarification um, except the sludge contains useful microorganisms that can be recycled back to the aeration basins uh, where they're mixed with incoming flow to keep up the nutrient removal process. And then some of the sludge is reused in the activated sludge process and some are wasted um, and combined with other solids that are used in the solids handling process. So design parameters that are important for secondary clarifiers are just the same as primary clarifiers, but they usually um, have, have lower concentrations that you want to remember. And they may vary based on the processes that they follow, such as if it's activated sludge or trickling filters. So following our secondary treatment or biological treatment, uh, typically you might have tertiary treatment. Uh, this will be required for plants that have a um, higher effluent quality requirement and refers specifically to treatment that removes pollutants other than BOD and TSS. Um, tertiary treatment does include disinfection. And like I said, we do tend to keep it separate, but uh, it is just infection is an example of tertiary treatment that removes pathogens. Um, a lot of times though, they refer, uh, these refer to processes that remove phosphorus and nitrogen if it's not removed through the secondary treatment process. Um, a basic type of tertiary treatment is a constructed wasteland, I'm sorry, constructed wetland, uh, which works like a trickling filter, but is more of a polishing process than a primary biological process. Uh, for first, for certification exam uh, process, um, purposes, I would recommend um, understanding vegetation control of wetlands, um, operation, and uh, permit requirements. So tertiary treatment can also be designed to target specific pollutants, such as those um, created by you know, special industries or excessive domestic use. Um, they remove specific, uh, special contaminants such as mercury, microplastics, uh, PVCPs, which are personal care products, and, I'm sorry, pharmaceuticals and personal care products, and then also excessive chlorine. Um, mercury is typically removed through precipitation by adding sulfide, alum, or other coagulants and adjusting the pH of the processes so they can be precipitated out. Um, and then also microplastics and pharmaceuticals are typically removed um, through such processes as advanced filtering, which includes microfiltration, ultrafiltration, nanofiltration, and reverse osmosis. Um, these are processes that are being researched though, and they're emerging, because um, it can be difficult to apply them to wastewater due to their tendency for clogging and fouling, um, and they're not quite optimized for wastewater. So like I said, an example of tertiary treatment is disinfection. This is typically done through chlorination, ozone, or UV. Um, the industry is typically uh, shifting towards UV due to issues with um, you know, the safety of chlorination. Um, this is important to prevent the spread of waterborne diseases. And um, the first example we'll talk about is chlorination, because uh, even though the industry seems to be shifting away from it, uh, the exams still um, use them heavily um, and talk about them a lot. You know, you're going to want to know um, feed rates of your chlorine tanks. You're going to want to understand the different devices that are used in chlorination. But 
basically chlorine can be introduced to wastewater in three forms. It can be liquid, which is your uh, sodium hypochlorite, solid, which might be your um, chlorine um, powders, and then also in gas. Um, so typically when you use chlorination, you're gonna require a chlorine residual. And this uh, will include the understanding of breakpoint chlorination. So this is the point at which you um, are adding chlorine to the system and it's breaking down microbes and then starts to form long lasting um, chlorine products, which are called chloramines. And that creates your chlorine residual. Um, also dechlorination must occur to prevent uh, such things as fish kills. Uh, this is typically done through, uh, you know, long detention times in serpentines or uh, the addition of um, sulfur dioxide, um, introducing into UV light. There's a variety of ways to address dechlorination because chlorine is so reactive. So the um, another example, which um, seems to be implemented more and more, um, is UV disinfection. Uh, it's typically safer than chlorination, like we talked about. Uh, there will be no residual required. Um, it's also less space intensive because you don't have to worry about holding times um, or um, detention times for dechlorination. And so these are basically just long banks of lights that are placed in a channel and the what as far as allowed to come into contact with them. And the light is specifically designed to have a wavelength of 253 nanometers, which disinfects the bacteria. So it's not actually destroying them, what it's doing is making them unable to reproduce. So when they go out, they can't reproduce. And that's typically the issue that um, bacteria causes when they're reproducing and taking up space for other small organisms or um, kind of making you sick that way. Um, so they're sterilized and that's to prevent any negative impacts on the environment and public health. So the final step that we see in wastewater um, is our solids handling. So um, pumped primary and secondary sludge must be disposed of properly. Uh, they contain pathogens um, and they must go to special facilities that can handle them. Um, typically the sludge is regulated for the presence of those pathogens and also heavy metals and other substances that can be harmful to people and the environment. Um, also it's important that water must be removed during the sludge um, treatment process. So the primary way that sludge treatment is done is through uh, digestion. So this allows um, anaerobic microbes to break down um, organics and other stuff that can cause odors. Um, and they must be digested to um, stabilize them. Um, also secondary uh, sludge, because it's lighter than primary sludge, is typically dewatered before being introduced to the digesters. And uh, that also produces useful microorganisms that increase the digestion efficiency in those digesters. So here's an example of some dewatering technology. So a basic one that's been used for a long time is sludge drying beds. Uh, basically after the sludge has been um, digested in the digester, um, you know, it depends on the amount of time, but usually you're looking about like 30 days or so, and they're, um, you know, big cylinder containers that hold in, allow the anaerobic activity to occur, uh, they're applied to land um, in you know, thinner sheets where they basically just use the arid environment or sun to um, you know, bake them and then they can be uh, used for land application after they are dewatered. Um, on the right is an example of a mechanical technology that's used. Uh, these are centrifuges and they will also operate on the um, concept of specific gravity where they'll spin at a high uh, level and the water will separate out while the solids are concentrated in the middle and pass through to either a bin or solids. And then, um, so dewatering is important because it allows the sludge to be moved easier. Um, and then, you know, in places like Albuquerque, um, the sludge is actually uh, used for composting after it's dried. So it's dried and transferred up to an, an amendment facility where a little more treatment occurs. Um, and they can use it for composting and people can use it for their gardening. Um, and that is the end of the overview. Um, we do have some poll questions that, a, um, that Avery is going to show everyone right now.
Hello, Ava, are you there? Hey, yeah, AJ, are you still on with us? Yeah, did you guys? Uh, I yeah, can no, hear I'm you now, but you did cut out. When? Um, sorry. Is what? it time to launch the polls? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Did you guys, you guys heard my presentation, right? <laughs> Yes. yes, yes, I heard your presentation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was worried I was talking for an hour. No one heard me. <laughs> All right, so I should launch the first poll now? Yes, please. Okay, so um, and I, you know, we touched on this um, in the beginning of the presentation. So this is the type of question that you might see on a certification exam. Um, so what is the name for raw wastewater coming into the treatment plant? Right. It looks like about 74% have voted, so I'm going to leave it up um, for a few more seconds. Make sure to get your answers in. All right, I'm going to close the poll in three, two, one. And there are your results. All right, so it looks like um, you know most of you guys got it. Um, it is the influent. Uh, if you remember, effluent is uh, the wastewater that's been treated and discharged to the point source. And then surface water is typically what you might see as a point source, being your rivers and lakes. And then influent is what's coming from the collection system. So that's the correct answer. And no one picked secondary flow, and I think I just made that word up. So we move on to the next one. I'm launching our second poll now. So the next one is um, secondary treatment is what type of process? And the answers are physical, toxic, electrical, or biological. I'm going to close the poll in three, two, one. All right, awesome. So again, it looks like most of us got it correct. Um, it is a biological process. Uh, like we talked about, it usually uses um, a fixed film, uh, which contains microorganisms, or the suspended growth, which contains microorganisms. And that's where we get the idea that it's biological, because we have biological organisms doing the process. Uh, a physical process would be more like um, the clarification that we talked about, bar screening, where you have a physical device or you're utilizing a physical concept to separate water from contaminants. Um, I'm not really sure what a toxic process might be um, or an electrical. Um, again, I think I kind of just made those answers up. All right, so I'm going to launch our third poll. Okay, so uh, this is a single answer, but uh, wastewater treatment plants are designed to treat or remove the following except. And you have the answers are oxygen, ammonia, grit, and BOD. Closing the poll in three, two, one. And there are your results. Okay, good job. Again, we got it correct. Uh, the answer is oxygen. If you remember, ammonia is typically treated um, as part of our 
activated sludge or our nitrification process where we want to utilize um, oxygen to remove it. Uh, grit is removed in our pretreatment part, and that's an example of a physical treatment where we want to settle out that grit to protect our equipment. And then BOD is also removed also in our biological process. Um, oxygen, from my understanding, I don't know of any plants that are trying to remove oxygen. Usually it's something that you do want to, you have to have um, a dissolved oxygen level in your wastewater. And um, a lot of plants have a, a permit requirement for that. And that's to make sure that you encourage the health of the environment that it's going to. Our poll is launched now. So the next question is, what is the desired TSS concentration for wastewater effluent? Um, and the question, the answer, so the possible answers are five pounds, 30 milligrams per liter, 200 milligrams per liter, or 45 milligrams per liter. And this is the desired concentration. I do want to know if you get the answer wrong, you won't be penalized. These are just um, test questions for you all today. Yeah, I try to you know mimic questions that I've seen on certification exams and stuff like that. So it's really just to help you guys get an idea of what kind of information you might want to be studying for. Close the poll in three, two, one, and there are your results. Awesome. So again, most of us got it correct. Um, this question can be a little misleading because we do talk about that 30-45 rule, um, but we're looking for the desired and goal, which was on that first chart. Um, and so it is 30 milligrams per liter. So a good way to kind of weed out, and this is a, you know, a good test prep um, strategy, is the first one says five pounds. You know, five pounds is a measurement of weight and not a concentration. So, you know, when you see this kind of answers, it's good to look for that kind of stuff and you can weed out this one right away. Um, 200 milligrams is typically what you see in the influent. And then 45 is more of a permit associated number. And that's what, you know, most places have for, um, that they can have for a seven day average, like their max. That's part of the 30, 45 rule. But the correct answer for the desired goal is 30 milligrams per liter. So good job everyone. All right, now I am launching our final poll. Okay, so does anyone remember what the detention time for a primary clarifier should be? The answers are two to three hours, 10 to 14 hours, one to two days, and 24 hours. All right, I'm closing the poll in three, two, one. And there are your results. All right, again, so most of us got it. Um, it is two to three hours. Um, and this is just kind of one of those ones that we kind of have to be just from memory. Um, if you'll remember that most of the water you know, passes out pretty quickly and you want to keep a um, you know, low sludge blanket, um, two, three hours. Uh, it's just one of those ones you kind of have to remember. 24 hours would be much too long. It'd be in there for a whole day. It'd go septic, same with one to two days. And you will see pretty heavy septic conditions at 10 to 14 hours as well. And so at this point, um, I think James has been monitoring the chat. So if there's any questions we want to address, um, I do realize that it's 11, but. Uh, I'm still free. Other people are staying on. Yeah, there's no questions that we haven't answered so far. Mostly it was just sort of technical questions about, you know, presentations and credits and where to get uh, the handouts. And for those of you who haven't seen it, the handout uh, of the slides is available down at the bottom of your go to webinar control panel. Um, so let's see, we got a good presentation <laughs> and full questions. Thank you. Um, 
from Chris, uh, and this is, I guess, just one for you, Avery. When will they get the code for CEUs? This presentation was not pre-approved for CEU. Right. We will be sending out a certificate of attendance to all of today's attendees um, for your personal record, or if you can self-submit your certificate to your, your licensing agency, but this was not pre-approved for credit today. And those certificates typically take how long, roughly, to get out? Uh, roughly two to three weeks. All right, well, if there are no questions, then I want to thank you, AJ, for sharing your expertise with us today. Um, following this webinar, all attendees will receive an email with the slides and a link to the recording. We also ask that you complete our evaluation as this helps us plan on future webinars on topics important to you. Um, so thank you and um, if you have any questions that pop up after the session, please feel free to follow up with me or with AJ. Um, and if you follow up with me, I'll make sure you get, get into the right hands. So um, thank you and hope you all have a great rest of your day. Uh, AJ, do you have any final remarks for our audience today? No, not at all. Uh, thanks for everyone attending and uh, I appreciate your time. All right. Bye, everybody.